Good morning to all the viewers of this today's international webinar series on open source digital technologies to, towards self reliant India, Atmanirvar Bharat, hosted by Soviet Institute of Engineering and Technology, Merit, deemed to be university, for the audience of both in India and abroad. On behalf of the Chancellor of the Soviet Institute of Engineering and Technology, Merit, and on behalf of Center of Excellence, Center for Informatics Development Solutions and Applications, and Center for Industry 4.0 Technologies <laughs> and Applications, welcome the participants from India and abroad for this international webinar series. Under this international webinar series, these centers of excellence have organized eight lectures so far. The first one was on open technologies to provision simple and economical IT infrastructure held on 12th September 2020, addressed by Dr. P. Balasubramanian, former Deputy Director General, National Informatics Center, and head of NIC Open Technology Center, Chennai. The second one was on, on 18th September 2020 by Dr. P.K. Mishra on roadmap for students using free and open source software and reaching goals of Atma Nirbar Bharat. Open source software and industrial IOTs for SMEs addressed by Dr. H.K. Suga, former Deputy Director General, National Informatics Center on 25th September 2020. Mr. M. R. Rajakopalan, former director, Center for Development of Advanced Computing, Chennai, and a director, National Research Center on Free, uh, free Open Source Software, Chennai, on 3rd October 2020. Mrs. Alka Mishra, Deputy Director General, National Information Center, on 10th October 2020 addressed on open data platform for smart digital government technology imperatives making india for self-reliance by dr kamlesh kumar bajaj former director of certain ministry of communication and information technology and founder ceo data security council of india on 17th october 2020 Edge Artificial Intelligence by Dr. Petro Raj Chelaya, Chief Architect and Vice President from Reliance Joe Platform Limited, Bangalore, on 24th October. 2020. Data Governance for Self Reliant India by Mr. K. Rajashegar, State Informatic Officer, NIC State, Hyderabad, Telangana State, and Head Center for Data Governance, National Informatics Center, Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology. Government of India, New Delhi, on 31st October 2020. Today, we will have a talk by an eminent technocrat of the country, Dr. Y.K. Sharma, former Director General, National Informatics Center, on the topic Digital India and Society. Technology is the sum of techniques, skills, methods, and processes used in the production of goods and services or in the accomplishment of objectives such as scientific investigation. Topic in the webinar series is a growing list. We covered a technology imperatives, open systems, open source software for open infrastructure, Open hardware for open infrastructure, open data, open data platform, human resources development, startups in open technology, open society, industry 4.0, edge computing, edge artificial intelligence, data governance, and today digital India transforming governance and society. Atmanirbar Bharat. Atmanirbar Bharat, self reliant India, is the vision of Prime Minister of India, Sri Narendra Modi of making India a self-reliant nation rested on five I's, intent, inclusion, investment, infrastructure, and innovation, and based on five pillars, economy, quantum jump, and not incremental. Infrastructure, one that represents modern India. Systems, 21st century technology driven. 
vibrant demography, source of energy for self-reliant India and demand, whereby the strength of our demand and supply chain should be utilized to full capacity. This was announced on 15th May 2020 by the central government through a special and comprehensive economic package of rupees 20 lakh crore that accounts for 10 percent of India's GDP to bring the economy back on track. Vocal for local to make it global. The reforms announced have, have been systematic, planned, integrated, interconnected, and futuristic for creating strong enterprises, generating employment, and robust supply chain. This is our intent. Digital India transforming governance and society. Information theory of Claude Elwood Shannon, 1948, to Internet of Things, IoT, of Kevin Astar, 1999, have impacted digital technological applications very decisively in various development fields. Robotic process automation through virtual software agents and physical robots provide enormous opportunities for products development by, emer by emerging technology startups. Digital signal processing, IOTs and robotics are the essential components of Industry 4.0 applications. Fourth industrial revolution is the ongoing automation of traditional manufacturing and industrial practices using modern smart technology Industry 4.0 and Unfortunately, Industry 4.0 is not under the banner of Digital India, but it has got 10 technology pillars. Data for development, informatics led the development, internet led, led the development, internet led economy, etc., etc., etc. In 1970s, Baba Atomic Research Center, Electronic Corporation of India Limited, ECAL, and ISA Kolkata developed Trombay Digital Computer 360 and ported Unix operating system and operationalized in India. In 1975, the government of India strategically decided to take effective steps for the development of information systems and the utilization of information resources and also for introducing computer-based decision support systems. We call, called it at that time informatics-led development in the government ministries, the departments to facilitate planning and program implementation to further the growth of economic and social development. Following this, the central government nucleated a high priority plan project called National Informatics Center in 1976. Since then, India has been achieving its milestone and digitalization through its national program called e-government, NICNET, DISNIC in 1986, 28 sectoral database development program for 512 plus districts, NICNET infrastructure facilities in districts and state and central government ministries in 1987, state informatics program in state and UTs in 1987, JISTIC information dissemination cast in 1987, intra NIC 2002, intra GOV open source, e office in 2010, national knowledge network in 2008 and 2010, national portal of India, open data, open GOV, CORTIS, and etc. etc. Digital networks for former ISDA 1995, Smart Village Scheme 2002 to 2007, e-governance program 2005, 27 mission mode project and the state wide area network, e-grant renewed strategy 2014, Digital India program 2015 and now National Open Digital Eco Ecosystem Node 2020. RTA Act 2005, which mandate mandates digitalization of government of government departments. Many government departments' websites do not carry RTA Act ready sticker, but it carries the tic tickets only for compliance of you know worldwide wide you know compliance and GA GW etc etc. And secretary of the department or head of the institution has not put their stamp of approval stating that the department stands by the information available in the website, but it has a disclaimer statement. When I was the deputy director general e-governance standards in NIC. I raised this issue of stamp of approval in 2005-2006. Digital India program, Power to Empower. Digital India launched by the Prime Minister of in, uh, India, Narendra Modi, on 1st July 2015 is centered on three key areas. Digital infrastructure, governance and services on demand, digital empowerment of citizens. 
It is both enabler and beneficiary of other government ETF schemes such as Bharatnet, Make in India, Startup India, State of India, uh, Stand Up India, Industrial Corridors, Bharat Mala, Sagar Mala. As of 31st December 2018, India had a population of 130 crore people, 123 crore other in a, you know uh, digital biometric identity cards, 121 crore mobile phones, 44.6 crore smartphones. 56 crore internet users. MyGov.in is a platform to share inputs and ideas on matters of policy and governance. Unified mobile application for new age governance among is the government of India all in one single unified secure multi-channel, multi-platform, multilingual, multi-service freeware mobile app for accessing over 1200 central and state government services in multiple Indian languages over Android, iOS, Windows and USSD feature phone devices. Bharat Interface for Money, Beam app, developed by National Payment Corporation of India based on Unified Payment Interface Gateway. Jam Trinity Technology, Jantan Account, Aadhaar Mobile. Nine pillars of growth area, broadband highways, universal access to mobile connectivity, public internet access program, e-governance, reform, e-governance, men for reforming government through technology, E Granthi, electronic delivery of services, information for all, electronic manufacturing, IT for jobs, early harvest programs, other smart city missions, BIM UPA, Rupe, uh, goods and services, uh, service taxes, India, government e marketplace, DigiLocker, Swatch Bharat Mission, app, e sign framework, online registration systems, national scholarship portal, Digitize India program, ENAM, Atmartnet, national animal disease reporting system connecting 7,032 locations, and NICnet, National Knowledge Network, Bharatnet, Railtel, BSNL, Indian Postal Services, STPA, Common Services Center, Airtel, Reliance Geo, et cetera, et cetera. India is witnessing competition among state, union territories, NCT governments in visualizing and operationalizing location-specific e-government, e-governance program in India in addition to national program. The vision of you know, Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology is e-development of India as the engine for transition into a developed nation and an empowered society, e-government, e-industry, e-innovation, e-learning, e-security, e-inclusion, internet governance. COVID-19 lockdown situation has forced everybody to adopt digital technology in all walks of life. Work from home has become the new normal. But cybersecurity issue has become both a challenge and opportunity. Notwithstanding the economic slowdown, digital payment transaction continued to surge in September and crossed pre-COVID levels in categories like UP, UPI, you know, I, IMTS and fast tax that as reported by Business Line, 1st October 2020. According to the World Bank report, 10% growth in mobile and broadband penetration upsurged the per capita GDP by 0.81% to 1.38% in developing countries. India's digital economy has the potential to become 1 trillion USD, US dollar ecosystem by 2025. According to DataQuest July 2020 issue, it is also the time for India to forge digital policies that are tailored made for the Indian scenario and tap into the vast treasure trove of technical competence of India disposal. India has more than 4,500 engineering colleges, 18,000 non-engineering colleges, IITs, NITs, IIMs, Triple ITs, Indian Institute of Science and Education, uh, Science for Education, Science Education Research, more than 1,500 universities which are importing IT research, education, development programs. About 224 Chinese apps have been banned recently. GeoMeet app has now emerged from India, impacting societies in India. Sinkari, a short video app, Competitor to Tic Tac has about 2.7 crore users in India. Let us now turn to the address by Dr. Y.K. Sharma, our guest speaker today, on a topic which will galvanize everybody watching over telecast through Facebook.com, oblique Soviet University India, or YouTube.com, oblique Soviet University in. His talk aims to provide a peek into what the digital India could mean to a common man of the country, where 22 Indian languages are constitutionally recognized. So many languages in so many dialects are being spoken today. Technologies, namely artificial intelligence, big data analytics, blockchain technology, cloud computing, fog computing, edge computing, mobile computing, 
GIS Industry 4.0, Green Technology, naming genome, robotics, informatics, and nanotechnology will lead or leading to digital transformation in, cover, in governance and society into e-governance and society 4.0. The present NDA government, Modi 2.0, is making no stone unturned to establish society 5.0. Dr. Y.K. Sharma. is a former director general national informatics center government of india he has phd in computer science from indian institute of technology and he has got more than 42 years of professional experience in variety of e-governance area designed and developed large it projects for the government and he was an advisor e-governance to you know, uh, you know uh, unique identification authority of india government of india consultant center for development of advanced computing pune as an expert it for computation commission of india and advisor it to real estate regulatory authority rera of nct of delhi and presently advisor application of artificial intelligence early detection of cancer project in all the institute of medical science delhi and also advisor IT infrastructure services and IIT Bilai. Dr. Vaikya Sharma is known for his technological interventions in various ongoing e-government projects. He has the credit of establishing national data centers at NIC Delhi and Pune. He has implemented ICT infrastructure and application as a part of national optical fiber network pilot project at three blocks headquarters and 59 gram panchayat and has also established a computer communication network and setting up of computer community information centers at block level in northeastern states and jammu and kashmir and he has also done the data center migration and iso 2 27001 certification for information security at unique identification authority of india he has led large software projects namely e-office e-hospital and e-procurement and cooperative core bank system ccts he managed technology and technical support to direct benefit transfer scheme of the government it solutions to fertilizer subsidy management and point of sale devices at fertilizer sale and distribution points electronic transaction aggregation and analysis system across india as a part of digital india initiative of department of you know uh, electronics and the information technology. And he was involved in evaluation of various e-governance project of National Informatics Center. He has first seen technology induction, research and development project and federated database management system in 1987, email services at national level over NICNET in pre-internet era 1989, first patent from NIC 1994, multi-city video conferencing in 1995, inducting portal framework and tools in web-based projects at NIC 2006, involving private sector in NIC implemented e-governance project for upscaling NIC efforts in 2007 and inducting speech recognition tools in e-governance application 2012. He has to his credit about party research reports, publications and special projects in the area of ICT infrastructure and e-governance. Dr. Vaikya Sharma, we would like to listen to your ad address on the topic, Digital India, Transforming Governance and Society. Over to you. Thank you, Professor Moni. Thanks for very longish introduction. Thank you for that. And good morning, the viewers of this program. We're going to spend uh, next uh, 60 minutes or so, uh, talking about a huge success story of this country. You know, most of the time when we're talking of technology in India, we are talking about kind of a catch up game, that this is what is happening around the globe. This is what India should be doing. Uh, what I'm going to present in next uh, uh, 50, 60 minutes or so is that how India has leveraged upon what has been going around technologically in the world of digital technologies and leverage it not for technology development alone, but leverage it so extensively in a manner 
that today uh, in the form of a digital india program which was launched in 2015 by the government today the situation is that whether we realize it or not virtually every aspect of an indian citizens in some form is touched by information technology or by the digital technology so let me move on to the presentation just to give me a moment I hope the slide is visible, Ms. Prabhupada Is visible. Hmm. Okay. Okay. Uh, now, before we talk of uh, uh, digital India and what's happening in India, and we talk of digital technologies uh, uh, around the world in general, uh, I would like to spend a few minutes taking all of us back. To where it all started uh, because we tend to you know forget uh, uh, the initial you know stages of development but there are huge lessons to be learned from those uh, developments uh, so let me take you back to uh, to 70s actually uh, i just spent you know five seven minutes uh, talking about uh, you know how we have reached where we are today uh, way back, uh, and I'm sure most of the people who must be uh, listening to this talk, uh, you know, they probably must be aware of it, but they probably won't have witnessed uh, those eras. Some of us uh, have been fortunate to witness uh, the entire development in information technology and the digital technologies right from mid 70s onwards. Probably not many people know that it was somewhere around 1974 that uh, Gary Kildare uh, had developed what was popularly known as CPM, operating system, for 8-bit chips from Intel, 885 essentially. That development was being marketed at that time, and CPM was very popular those days on microprocessors, and most of the microprocessor-based systems were obviously using CPM at that point of time. Uh, because of, uh, you know, the windows and all those things, we have, in fact, uh, virtually forgotten uh, that era. Uh, now, that development, uh, while it was going on, IBM, somewhere in mid-80s, had started working on the first uh, personal computer. At that time, IBM noticed uh, the work of Gary Kirchner on CPM. And IBM, and it is said that IBM was prompted by Bill Gates at that point of time. And IBM started talking to Gary uh, to see whether CPM could be upgraded to 16-bit uh, you know, processor. And it could be uh, you know, moved to uh, IBM's uh, PC, which was under, under development. Somehow, that uh, didn't work out because it was taking time for Gary to move from 8-bit to 16-bit. In parallel, there was another development which was happening where Mr. Tim Peterson of Seattle Computer Products uh, was working on it, uh, Intel 8086-based uh, chipset. Uh, IBM uh, and Microsoft at that time uh, you know, visited that and liked the idea, and a deal was uh, uh, you know, settled. And in December 1980, uh, Many of us would be surprised to know that a deal was set for $25,000, just $25,000 uh, with Tim Peterson and Microsoft to adopt uh, Tim Peterson's uh, 86 DOS onto IBM PC. That is how the whole, whole story began. Uh, we all believe that Microsoft was the first to build uh, the operating system, but the fact remains that Microsoft's initial work was actually adopting Tim Peterson's 86 DOS. And that work gave rise to 
IBM's PC DOS 1.0 in July 1980. In July 81, and uh, in August 81, IBM announced the first personal computer. Uh, I won't say first personal computer of the world. I'll come to that in a moment. Uh, but first personal computer from IBM uh, was announced in August 91. Uh, then onwards, of course, the development went on and on. Uh, the first, uh, uh, you know, Windows, as we know, the first Windows, Windows 1, was launched in November 1985. Windows 2 in December 87, 3 in 98, and Windows 10, as we are very familiar with, was uh, launched in September 2014. September 2014. So these couple of uh, names, uh, you know, Gary Keldrell, Tim Peterson, Bill Gates, you know, they are very key names uh, in this uh, era of digital technologies, in the initial ages of digital technologies. While all this was happening, uh, I'm sure many of us, of course, are aware that parallel to this, one another person who would uh, can be easily called the father figure of what we see today, the form of uh, you know GUI-based interfaces for all the devices. Steve Jobs was working on on the Apple series, and much ahead of uh, IBM PC announcement in '81. In 1976, Steve Jobs announced Apple I, followed by Apple II in 77, Apple III in 83. And the first Mac, which we are very familiar, of course, Mac has undergone huge developments and changes since then. In 1984, first Mac was announced for $2,495. This is how the development was taking place. Uh, Another major development which was happening parallel to all this was the evolution of mobile phone technology. Initial uh, period of mobile phones was dominated by Nokia and Motorola, as uh, most of us will know. Uh, Apple entered the field with iPhone 1 in 2007. And uh, since then, uh, every year nonstop, you know, from 2007 to now, Apple has announced uh, new uh, products in the iPhone series. And uh, beginning with iPhone 1 in 2007, uh, this year, I, iPhone 12 was announced by, uh, by Apple. Now, this is the direction of how the devices and technologies were growing. But the devices and technologies did not really had a transformation, did not have so much of transformation effect on society as was the launch of some of the very key services which have become part of our day to day life. And these were uh, the launch of Facebook in February 2004, launch of YouTube in 2005, uh, and then Twitter in 2006, and then onwards. I mean, the whole lot of uh, other things have happened in the market. Now, what has happened over the years, as uh, one would see, that technology development has grown and kept pace with the technology on one side and services on the other side. Today, if we find the digital technologies have become part of our, our life, you know, uh, it is uh, a combination of technology and the services. And the, also the point that has to be noted that the services which have evolved over these technologies are the services which are relevant to people, which people you know, need uh, for their day-to-day -day life. And that is the challenge technology people have been uh, dealing with. And that is the outcome of meeting those challenges that today digital technologies have become part of our day-to-day -day life. So with a short uh, history of what has happened, let me come to my structured presentation. I have uh, tried to structure this presentation in five major segments. I'm going to begin with uh, talking of a complete ecosystem. Because when you really use a service, you know, a uh, whole lot of things we take for granted. Uh, I'm going to spend a few minutes on how these services actually reach us. You know, what goes behind, uh, you know, building a service and making sure that service is available to people in the form that we are used to it. Uh, I'm going to then touch upon 
you know, how social media has evolved. I'm going to then talk about how Digital India program uh, has been conceived by the government and conceived by the government, not just for the government's sake, but for the sake of the society. We will then, uh, you know, when we talk of all pervasive Digital India, there are, of course, uh, many aspects of Digital India that we could talk about. I have picked up two of them, governance and education. Uh, with the, the primary objective of picking up these two segments is that these two are core to our you know, socio-economic development. Governance, of course, is, is at the heart of uh, you know, virtually everything which happens in the country. Which happens in the country in government sector or it happens in the country in uh, outside the government sector. And the second important field, as we, most of uh, the people who must be listening to this from, from education field, either students or faculty or educationists and the planners for education and all, education is the key to development. If we can take care of education, if we can align education with the needs of our society, I think the rest will all follow. So that's a plan for next uh, you know, 45 minutes or so uh, that we have uh, at our disposal now. So this is the slide. I'm going to sp uh, stay on this slide for uh, 10, 12 minutes just to touch upon you know, the complete ecosystem that brings the services to us. Uh, you begin on the left-hand side. Uh, you see that the user community of it, the citizens, the governments, and the businesses, or and, and anybody else who is the user uh, of the government. Uh, now, if you come to the you know the ecosystem uh, for a typical digital service, uh, the first layer is the access layer. Now, access layer we are all familiar with desktop, we are all familiar with mobiles, and I said that the mobile have undergone major transformation uh, as we have come along in last uh, fifteen years or so. Most more in the last 10, 12 years. But what is happening that uh, there is a huge uh, innovation happening in the device sector itself in the digital world. We have all heard of, of uh, Alexa. We have all heard of uh, you know, how Siri is working. We have all heard of uh, you know, how speech-based interaction is happening. Some of the recent developments of uh, watch launched by Samsung and Apple are examples of how, how devices are becoming one of the most important aspects of how the digital technology would reach the people. And uh, if you look at the bottom of this slide, on the enabler side, one of the most important aspects is the technology innovation. And the most important aspect of technology innovation is how do you make people access the service? You know, Because if the service is complicated to access, it is not going to really work. You know, And next slide, we're going to see you know, what has actually made the social media what it is today because of some of these issues which have been dealt with by the technology people. So, so there's a huge scope of innovation in this. And I'm sure as we go along, the device technologies are going to see major uh, transformation as we go along. We have uh, uh, the next layer is, of course, applications. We are all familiar with huge applications of Facebook, WhatsApp, and whatnot. Uh, you know, beginning with the small is, is the SMS and things like that. The next layer is a layer of communication systems. Okay, uh, this uh, begins with telecom service providers. Many times we take it for granted, you know, that our telecom connection will work. But as we have all many times also seen that sometimes you have beautiful systems, you have very nice service done, but the end user doesn't get access to it because suddenly you find that the network connection is off, you know. And we don't really realize that what efforts go behind, you know, making the telecom networks, which have now graduated uh, to, to the digital networks, uh, providing the backbone to digital services, you know, how they operate. The major operators in India, uh, Airtel, Vodafone, Zio, VSNL, uh, and the concept of shared infrastructure. As you would, most of us will know, uh, the whole concept of the telecom infrastructure for digital services began by telecom service providers setting up their own telecom infrastructure. VSNL, of course, had the uh, uh, advantage of being the, being the you know, uh, the leader in the country for ages, 
BSNL had a huge, uh, you know, telecom infrastructure, in, including the fiber uh, optic network across the country. When, uh, you know, people like Airtel came, they put their own infrastructure, you know. Uh, but slowly people realized that uh, setting up telecom infrastructure has totally different, uh, you know, requirements, has totally different uh, business models, has totally different technology innovation uh, area. And that is why it's probably worth uh, decoupling telecom infrastructure with the services which will ride on top of it. And that is what has given, uh, you know, rise to the shared infrastructure. Uh, from the shared telecom infrastructure, the systems have now evolved to sharing the backend infrastructure. I'll come to that in a moment to that. Uh, while all this was happening, Mr. Moni briefly mentioned uh, of uh, you know the development in the government sector in the form of NIC. NIC established in 1976 or so. Uh, by 2000, by the turn of the century, NIC was present in every district, every state government, uh, not only from technology perspective. NIC had uh, you know uh, data centers in every state. NIC had infrastructure in every district. NIC had initially starting with a satellite-based network. NIC had uh, developed, uh, you know, uh, had utilized uh, the terrestrial uh, network in a big way. And then NIC also realized that, uh, you know, there is a need to upscale this whole infrastructure, particularly to address the needs of education institutes in this country. And that is where a huge project of National Knowledge Network was launched uh, uh, somewhere around 2006, 7 uh, or so. And uh, the objective at, at that time, our uh, you know leading uh, institutions in the country, including IITs, you know, uh, were kind of struggling with low bandwidth connectivity. You know, and that time the government thought that there is a need to build you know infrastructure which would provide a high speed connectivity and not just connectivity. The idea was that the institutions of excellence in the country, the IITs, the NITs, the Institute of Science, the TFRs, the BARCs, you know, and the leading academic institutions, uh, universities, they must come onto one platform and be able to share the knowledge. And that is why it was not called National Network. It was actually called National Knowledge Network. The emphasis was on knowledge creation, knowledge acquisition, and knowledge sharing. And uh, that was, I, mean, I would say, in that era of, uh, you know, middle of uh, the last decade, 2005, 2006, 7 kind of time frame, that was a very imaginative idea that we could, uh, you know, float in the country. And uh, some of us feel very satisfied that today national knowledge network uh, provides uh, you know world standard connectivity and world standard uh, technologies to our top of the line technology institutes in this country that is what is more important you know uh, while this was happening uh, government also realized that while the urban connectivity is being taken care of there is a huge gap between uh, connectivity in urban and rural area and that is where government launched the program BharatNet, uh, where the idea uh, was uh, that every gram panchayat, every village panchayat, 250,000 odd village panchayats in this country, will be connected through high speed connectivity, taking fiber to the panchayat. And around the panchayat, build a, you know local network using wireless technology so that the villages around that could be serviced. You know? So that project. Uh, was launched and that project has uh, you know seen a major flip in last five years or so today uh, close to 150,000 panchayats are already on fiber network providing high speed connectivity so that is what the you know was have, has been happening uh, in india in last few years uh, not just to catch up with uh, what is happening around the world uh, in fact i somehow don't feel very comfortable when we say that we must catch up with the world uh, the real point is that india being a huge country india being you know such a, a country of so much of diversity by virtue of that india becomes a country of huge opportunities in every sector that you pick up and uh, the interesting thing about the digital technologies and the information technology is that 
they are not to grow for the sake of digital technology but they are to grow when they actually get integrated into various domains of services you know and that is what gives india a huge opportunity because the requirements of people in this country in various domains are so diverse and so you know uh, so important uh, for growth uh, of this nation that it gives a huge opportunity for innovation and that is why i feel that uh, you know the real uh, target for people like us in technology domain is not just to you know catch up with what youtube did in 2004 or what twitter did in 2006 or what facebook did in 2000 uh, you know five or so the target has because let's also realize the fact that as as i why i mentioned these dates you know 2004 5 6 for some of these uh, leading uh, products of today's world let's let's realize the fact that the thought process for developing these uh, you know technologies facebook twitter etc came up early 2000s you know 2002 3 4 kind of time frame which means that the thought process is almost 17 18 year old obviously there is now time to do you know completely different kind of uh, you know products and tools uh, for india to develop so i mean so so the challenge for all of us is not to catch up not to catch up with what's happening because uh, we must also realize that actually these are the people who are trying to catch up with indian requirement there is a need to evolve indian requirement and find solution to indian requirement and uh, and that is what gives opportunity to the technology people and it's an opportunity you know because uh, uh, i mean if you see a typical example you know one of the very typical example of how the india you know india based product got development meeting india's requirement was the wallet services in india you know uh, probably india was the first country where wallet services uh, Uh, paytm being a leader at initially now of course you got phone pay and many other uh, services uh, that you know they found uh, a niche for the people to use and today the today the situation is that uh, you know wallet services can be used by people who have no idea of technology you know they can just use one phone number to other phone number and you know transfer money and that is how the wallet services are no more considered uh, technology services they are actually become part of day to day life of the people and that is what you know is the challenge for the service providers uh, you know in this country and for all of us in the technology domain in this country and one of the things that we have to learn from all this is that technology people have to you know stop thinking of technology first you know many of us who are in technology domain have a habit of thinking of technology and applying technology to the requirements of the people this whole thought process has to be reversed you know uh, we have to first see and for that technology people have to actually move out technology people have to actually uh, integrate themselves with the domains domain people and then come with the solution you know i have seen personally i have uh, seen that whenever In, in fact, uh, in the NIC context, just a slight uh, distraction from from the sequence. Uh, whenever we used to go to a user uh, in the government, uh, you know, some of us who were very familiar with technology, you know, when we are discussing with a user, at the back of the mind while discussing, you know, many of our, our colleagues will will think, "Can I do it in Oracle? Can I do it in DBase? Can I do it in this?" You know, and then we'll try to. constrain the thought process of the user also to what we can do in technology now that scenario has to be reversed has been of course reversed in uh, many domains but that scenario has to be reversed and that is the only way that we are going to not just catch up with the world but we are going to innovate new technologies new services new solutions to meet the indian requirements now the the real heart of this whole services is uh, uh, in this uh, in the rightmost uh, top corner of this slide that is what are the back end data centers the back end infrastructure the networks the storage systems the the compute systems the networking and all that you know uh, as we all are familiar in fact uh, 
I mean, I'm sure many of the people uh, viewing this uh, are quite familiar with some of these things. But uh, if we just look at some of those astonishing, uh, you know, figures that uh, the kind of, uh, you know, search uh, queries which uh, Google search engine gets, you know, every second, it is estimated that 40 to 50,000 search queries per second are serviced by the Google search uh, engine. Now, that... And that, that's happening constantly because Google search engine is used around the clock in different parts of the world. I mean, there is no peak hours or non-peak hours uh, for uh, for uh, global IT services today. Okay, uh, that is the, another challenge for technology people. You know, many of us a uh, few years back have been used to taking downtime for launching new services or downtime for upgrading services. Of course, I know that in some areas, even today, off and on, you will get a you know SMS message that a service will be not available at middle of the night from 12 a.m. to 1 a.m. or so. It, it, some of these messages are still coming from the banking sector also. But the, the real uh, success story of the technology infrastructure today is that there is virtually no need of any downtime. You won't have ever you know, heard that YouTube is down uh, because YouTube services are to be upgraded. You won't have ever heard of... Uh, you know, Twitter and Google's uh, being down just because backend services are to be updated. So, so but but it doesn't come so easily. You know, uh, why I'm mentioning this for the technology people? This is one major segment where, as a nation, we have to you know build huge expertise. You know? Today, the fact remains, and I think it's a big challenge for education sector also, uh, particularly the education sector in the technology space uh, for IITs and institutions of that kind that we produce you know people who understand technology management technology infrastructure and solution architecture if you look around uh, and if you want to hire a solution architect where you have to build a service which will be accessed by millions of users on a daily basis and which will deal with millions of transactions a day to design an infrastructure for that is an absolutely non-trivial exercise, and you really don't find too much resources for that. So that's a huge infrastructure because uh, today data centers are not uh, single site located, they're multi-site located. They have to distribute. I mean, if you look at a typical Google data cent center, there are a number of data centers across the world, and uh, those data centers have to synchronize with each other in a manner that when you fire a query, you won't realize that the query, which you actually get a response in maybe two seconds or maybe less than two seconds, you know, and that response is not just a, a single response. That response is a response of multiple records that match your query. Those records are searched. Those records are ranked based on the utility from your perspective. So some of those things are, uh, you know, happening and we have a real challenge to address some of those infrastructures. So from the, from the perspective of, uh, of uh, the ecosystem, just to uh, summarize uh, in a minute, is that uh, devices in the hands of the pupil is a huge opportunity. Building uh, applications which match the requirements of the pupil is a huge challenge and a huge opportunity. The telecom infrastructure, the backend infrastructure, these are some of the segments which need to which need to be addressed. Now, what is enabling all this to happen? If you look at the bottom of this, there are, we talked of innovation. Uh, uh, one of the key innovation areas which is emerging is the area of artificial intelligence and machine learning. Uh, I will talk about it in the Indian context, context in a minute or so, but uh, artificial intelligence also has reached a level that we don't even realize that uh, you know our service is actually at the back end being run by ai tools you know uh, so for example when you when you listen to a uh, listen to a song on youtube and you you know uh, listen to one more song third time when you access youtube it will give you uh, you know a library of uh, you know a playlist of uh, for 50 songs which will very closely match with the, your choice of the couple of songs that you did. Now, it doesn't happen 
uh, through you know in in a in a very simplistic manner the very complex uh, technologies driven by ai techniques at different levels that uh, bring all that i mean this is a very trivial example which i mean is it trivial from user perspective not so trivial but uh, si similar things happening in many other domains we'll talk about uh, some of those things so ai is again uh, ai began uh, you know actually ai developments again began long back in japan many of us will probably remember in mid 80s you know japan was the first country which launched uh, uh, a program uh, uh, on artificial intelligence but uh, probably those things were ahead of times in fact when we say things are certain technology are ahead of times uh, we must realize that they are ahead of times not because people don't need them mm -hmm. they are ahead of times because the ecosystem is not completely built you know we may have a technology but delivery of technology that is what is the purpose of this slide that when you build a technology solution when you build a technology service that building the technology application is not enough it is necessary to build a complete ecosystem and we are not talking of marketing you know so my next point of enabler is on that you know how do you market them uh, we have currently seen a typical marketing model where people are not supposed to pay you know the company's revenue comes out of advertising slowly that model is also changing you know uh, you look at uh, you know some of the things like a star maker today uh, they don't really charge you subscription uh, s mule on the contrary charges you upfront uh, subscription but a star maker has a slightly different model you know they have a model that you can gift uh, you know stars to different uh, people and uh, to give a gift you have to you have to you know uh, earn coins now so different revenue models are evolving and the reason that different revenue models have to evolve is not that people do not want to pay people are willing to pay but then before they are willing to pay they must get uh, not just used they must get addicted to your service and you have to get people addicted to your service that service has to be you know designed in a manner that even if they don't need they get so used to it that it becomes part of their daily life and for that getting a right uh, revenue model and depending on revenue models you know equivalent financing models etc have to evolve so that is uh, uh, the next enabler uh, that of course uh, gives rise to huge entrepreneurship it's a matter of great satisfaction that in india in last uh, i would say 3 4 years large number of startup companies have come up in this country and india is probably world's third largest country in terms of uh, startups which is a great satisfaction because uh, one of the you know things that all of us in technology space used to is to say that silicon valley is the ultimate for startups you know it's a great uh, matter of satisfaction that india is uh, i i won't say that he, that as of now we are uh, we have reached where silicon valley is because again because the ecosystem is not completely you know in shape yet you know but it's early day i'm sure in next 4 5 years uh, our ecosystem for uh, startups will be much more strengthened because the startup ecosystem is again not just about getting investor you know getting investor is relatively not so difficult but getting investor is only one part of the story getting the entire ecosystem for the you know for the solution to be built to be delivered to people is what is what is really the challenge so so that's on the ecosystem we'll move on to you know uh, we partly covered this slide we move on to you know where social media is today and just picked up couple of points here just to you know uh, focus on things which uh, users take for granted but technology people do not uh, necessarily notice the need of that you know uh, i mean i i i keep saying that if uh, technology is so easy to use the back end technology people have done a lot of hard work for it okay because the back end technology will be that much complex but if a technology from the in the user hand is not that convenient uh, i mean not to you know reflect on the on on the service providers uh, uh, in that aspect just an example in this context that if today we find that you know filing income tax return and filing gst uh, return is not as convenient as using whatsapp or using uh, you know twitters and things like that uh, it's probably that we as technologists have to do much more work uh, in some of the domains to make uh, 
you know, some of those services uh, very convenient for people to use. So convenience to use is one of the key issues for, uh, you know, what has made social media what it is today and what will make any technology service, uh, you know, pervasive as uh, we would expect it to be. Focus on what user needs. We talked about it. We talked about a, st a study a user access patterns. Uh, another important thing which is happening, and I think I'm sure that the technology people uh, uh, know it, but probably don't realize, uh, you know, uh, how important it is and how uh, important it is from a user perspective and how important it is from uh, from technology perspective is that you could move things around in a very convenient way. Uh, just to give you one simple example, uh, you know, uh, if you are on your mobile phone, you can uh, copy a text from any one of the application and paste it in any other application. Now, as I'm saying this, the users of uh, mobile phone will, will wonder what is that so great that I'm talking about. But if you ask a computer science student of BTEC, you know, and uh, if, uh, and I, I, I'm, this is probably going to a very interesting uh, case study for, uh, you know, engineering students. If you ask an engineering student to build an application which will implement this on a, on a, on a desktop machine, uh, it is not going to be so trivial. Yeah. Uh, so uh, moving things around, uh, you know, in a seamless manner is one of the important aspects of services that you offer. I mean, just imagine, for example, if I uh, give my credentials, uh, let's say, to one of the government uh, application, okay, let's say, uh, you know, I give my credentials in income tax returns that I file about my name, date of birth, etc., and all. And when I apply for uh, a job somewhere, I use uh, my this thing, those credentials will get automatically moved into that. Now, I know there, are, there have been issues uh, related to privacy and all. I'm not going to that. I'll come to that separately. I'm talking purely from technology perspective. Uh, that will make usage of services so seamless, so easy that people will find, you know, we, we keep saying that using technology for many applications of the government is still not so easy. One of the reasons it's not so easy that because traversing from one to the other is still very complicated. Actually, there is hardly any traversing from one government application to other application. You know, you just can't move around, move things around. You know, they're all, uh, you know, I won't call them islands. They're definitely becoming more communicative, but they are definitely not so communicative with each other that you could actually seamlessly move things of common uh, pattern from one to the other. We talked about devices, we talked about any model, uh, and we all know the internet tariffs and all are playing an important role uh, on that. Now, so in this context of uh, what has been happening, let's just spend a few minutes on uh, uh, you know, how India has uh, planned. I'm not going into uh, I'm not going to list because Mr. Uh, Professor Moni in his uh, in initial introduction gave a fairly large list of various programs uh, that government has launched. I'm going to kind of do a meta uh, you know, presentation of that uh, as to what has been at the core of some of those thought, pro thought processes of the government so that uh, you know, those foundations are laid by the government on top of which various programs and services can be built. The very first thing, as we talked about, the government uh, attempted to bridge the gap between mobile service and urban rural areas and launched the BharatNet program. Another area which government found was a common service center. Government, government found that, you know, even if you put infrastructure in uh, particularly in rural areas, people still won't be so comfortable, you know, using technologies at point of time. And that's why it was thought that uh, while on one side government will take high speed connectivity to the rural area of this country, the service centers in the form of common service centers would be set up so that people can walk up to those service centers and get, a, you know, get access to the services that government is offering. It's a matter of great satisfaction that uh, uh, virtually every panchayat today has a common service center uh, in this country. Uh, we talked about NIC, NIC is continuing to grow grow and NIC uh, from initial setup of uh, data centers has moved into 
providing cloud based services for government application services because uh, because of nic the government has reached a level that if a service is to be developed whoever develops is not the issue for government you know it could be uh, by nic or by an agency you know uh, hired by a government department but you know deployment of those services has become so easy you know because uh, you get a cloud based uh, services you get multi tenancy based services some of those services are available on nic in infrastructure so that you could just take this thing ask for the infrastructure that you need and uh, you get uh, up and running uh, if you are able to manage uh, the deployment if you are not able to manage the deployment nic is there to help uh, uh, you know the people to you know deploy the services like that so that has you know contributed hugely in uh, making services available to the people you know uh, because uh, data centers are not just about you know compute network and thing data centers are more about managing the resources in a manner that they are optimally utilized and they are available you know 7 by 24 to the people we talked of how uh, wallet services uh, were encouraged by the government uh, and we all know that how during the demonetization uh, uh, time the wallet services got a major flip and uh, you know people got so used to it you know uh, so many people didn't have to actually draw cash which was a difficult that was a challenge and that challenge converted into opportunity and uh, you know which was a wallet service to the people uh, government has also been promoting online shopping services uh, shopping services uh, across the country have become another very uh, interesting uh, area uh, the covid of course has made it uh, while wallet services were made popular by uh, by the demonetization covid has made online shopping services hugely uh, popular and part of necessity and the government's encouragement to that sector has made a huge difference uh, we talked of innovation and how it's happening uh, realizing as we as you talked about uh, you know the developments in ai field and how ai is becoming integral part of it government has set up uh, a group uh, in the country which is looking into how uh, ai based uh, developments could be further promoted and encouraged in the country and i'm sure uh, that will give a major flip now while so much has been happening in the in the digital world uh, in india uh, obviously there are some you know fallouts of that which uh, need to be you know addressed as we are moving into that and one of the major issue which has emerged in a big way has been privacy of the data because as we are saying that the ai systems and analytics systems are able to do huge uh, analysis in fact the in fact the this uh, solutions today are virtually doing behavior analysis of the people I mean, as i said that if you listen to you know a few songs the system will know what you like you know if you uh, go to a shopping site and you search for i mean like i keep saying that the window shopping has com got completely transformed you just uh, search couple of uh, you know items of your choice on online shopping site and when you go and you know log into facebook you keep getting advertisements of the things you actually searched on something totally different you know searched on an online shopping site now how is it happening now that means that your own data is being analyzed very extensively by the high end tools and technologies so that you know the technology on the face of it is doing a great service to us you know uh, that uh, we are getting what we really need without really asking the system to tell uh, to to let us know what we need but the fallout of this also is that our data is being extensively analyzed now that is where the need of uh, data protection and data privacy has been there government has uh, given uh, you know a lot of uh, attention to this issue a personal data protection bill uh, is uh, uh, with parliament and it has been there in parliament uh, for some time now and we hope uh, uh, very soon the parliament will get approval to that so that we are all assured that uh, our data Uh, is not misused by the service providers so digital uh, technologies have become i don't have to really talk much about this slide uh, have become all pervasive from governance to education to health agriculture businesses industry 
manufacturing, industry and manufacturing, you know, particularly Mr. Professor Moni talked about uh, Industry 4.0. One of the key things of Industry 4.0 is going to be digital technologies. You know? And digital technologies for Industry 4.0, I'm sure the success of Industry 4.0 will not depend on how IT people are supporting industry but will depend on how IT has integrated into def different industry domains. You know? So if you look into the power industry, power sector, IT, in, I mean, it should not become an, I mean, today the typical scenario is that in every organization, you go to a bank, you go to an industry, you go to a you know, service uh, provider, you will find uh, an IT department and a domain department. You go to a typical bank, they will say IT department is doing this, we can't help it. The success of next level of uh, industry revolution is going to be integration of digital technologies into each of those domains you know and that is where again you know i very strongly feel and i'm coming to that slide in next few, few minutes is that education system has to play a very important role to to make that integration actually happen things like job search job search has completely got redefined today if uh, you know i'm um, you know all of us uh, listening to this are in the in the technology space and we all must be on linkedin kind of platforms today for example linkedin and i have no particular uh, this thing about linkedin as i'm just giving a case study uh, linkedin has completely transformed the way you search for a job today you don't have to even prepare your cv if you fill up the linkedin's uh, profile section linkedin knows you know what is your uh, skill set and LinkedIn has a facility that other people can endorse your skill set, you know. And you just look at the imaginative uh, model used by LinkedIn that if uh, I am endorsed for a certain skill by, let's say, a, an eminent person in that field, you know, LinkedIn will forward that to potential uh, employers, you know. And so, so you get a recommendation without asking for recommendation. So it's a, I mean, so these are the kind of uh, you know imaginative, uh, innovative things happening because the technologies are available. The space of entertainment we all know has completely changed. Uh, there was a time when uh, watching movies in theater had become, uh, you know, has, has become so less. Uh, the TV took over, and now even the TV channels may not be there in the present form today with the, all these. Uh, Netflix and uh, you know uh, all these things happening. Uh, you can watch programs whenever you want. Uh, so all this is happening. The point is that all this is happening today. What is going to happen five years from now? The challenge is that how successfully we are able to estimate the requirements of the pupil that we are supposed to serve. I'll take ten more minutes and close. I, I hope that should be fine, Professor Moni. Uh, have time we have time up to one o'clock okay, mm -hmm. so just take 10 12 minutes or two. now on the governance uh, front again uh, i mean there is no end to talking uh, what is happening in governance but i want to again highlight some of the uh, key drivers which have uh, helped uh, uh, the governance scenario being completely transformed we, in in the, our ecosystem uh, slide, we covered of infrastructure issues. In this slide, I'm going to talk about uh, what, uh, you know, uh, far-sighted uh, planning government did uh, last five years, five, six years, five, particularly five years, 2015 onwards is the, is the real story of transformation. Uh, I mean, obviously, this doesn't mean that nothing was happening in India prior to that. Obviously, a whole lot of things uh, had happened in earlier 20 years prior to 2015, but uh, a major flip has happened in the last five years because of uh, very far-sighted interventions at the level, which has given a quantum jump to the application of technology in the domain of governance. One of the key things, uh, you know, which was happening uh, on, the, on the on the point, uh, the topmost point on the right side of the slide, is that all along. Uh, and NIC, you know, was in the thick of things from the e-governance perspective. For large part of the technology induction story, 
in governance in this country was to improve the internal processes of governance in the government. You know, the attempt was that how do I computerize the processes in the government so that government processes become efficient. Now, which is good, which was probably required as the first step. But while doing that, many times the thrust was more to improve within than to see what impact has uh, this has on the people who are users of those services. Last few years, this whole thing has been turned upside down. Today, the thrust of the government is that how people will impact, you know, how their life will impact by using uh, the technology related to governance. And that is where, uh, you know, we see that, uh, uh, I mean, I'm sure that uh, all of you must have uh, uh, heard this uh, story that uh, when the first time uh, the prime minister's uh, scheme of uh, giving 6,000 rupees to each farmer was announced, it took just one click of a button uh, by the prime minister to transfer first installment of 2000 rupees into the accounts of millions and millions of farmers in this country. Now, that was probably a very major, you know, uh, you know, impact making program, uh, which, uh, which completely eliminated large number of layers between government and the beneficiary. Okay. And how it happened is, uh, uh, if you come back to the left hand side of the slide, the government launched three major initiatives, you know, way back in 2015 kind of time frame. Okay. First of all, Aadhaar has been around since 2010-11, uh, when the Aadhaar program was started. 2015 government uh, gave a major directive to UIDI that uh, the entire country has to be covered as fast as possible. And, uh, you know, I happen to be, uh, you know, post retirement, I happen to spend two years at UIDI uh, into technology space. And uh, I know that how those two years uh, during uh, 14, 15, uh, 16 kind of time frame, UIDI had put all its uh, power to make sure that every Indian, uh, every resident of India, as technically it is called, uh, not Indian citizen in that sense, uh, is covered. And today, uh, we have more than 91% population of India covered on Aadhaar. Aadhaar. Now, Aadhaar's impact was not just because you have a number, but the major thing which happened was the next initiative of the government. The government said that bank accounts have to be opened for underprivileged section of the people across the country, which was again a very fundamental shift uh, in the thinking of the government for many years, which was not ha happening. And the thrust of the government, you know, brought 40 crore, you know, bank accounts, uh, you know, into the system. They being linked to Aadhaar, uh, they ma it made it possible, as I gave an example, that government could, you know, take care of transferring funds under different schemes, you know, directly to the beneficiary so that there is no, uh, we, mid middleman is probably not the right uh, terminology to use, but there is no middle level agency required because we had multi tier agencies to transfer when the money was to go from the central government to and i'm not talking of um, you know mismanagement and leakage of funds that's a different part of the story i'm talking of the genuine difficulties in getting the even if the money was to genuinely go from central government to the large uh, uh, layer through the last layer there's so many agencies involved and obviously it used to take so much of time and effort for it to happen by taking the initiative of Aadhaar and bank accounts, uh, all this is happening uh, virtually without any effort. And then the mobile phone story, we are all familiar. So the outcome is that the subsidies transfer, the scholarship to students, the, the various uh, you know funds being transferred from government has all started happening. Another major you know, foundational thing which has happened is uh, government decision you know, which is again a huge, uh, you know, uh, 
uh, you know, decision by the government that all procurement of the government would happen through an online portal. You know, the GEM which government here. Government has two major portals uh, today, GEM uh, and uh, government uh, e-marketplace and uh, e-procurement, uh, there's a CPP, Center Procurement Portal of the government. CPP uh, happens to be built by NIC. It was built about uh, seven, eight, ten years back, uh, which is used uh, by all agencies of the government to publish their tenders. These have been two major initiatives of the government to bring complete transparency, because there was an era where uh, you know the vested interests will not even allow uh, you know upcoming uh, agencies to even bid for government tenders. Today, all that has you know completely become thing of the past. You know, people can apply from their homes without anybody knowing about it. The bids are open online. The bids are uh, analyzed electronically. There is no subjectivity. The fully objective manner things are happening. Uh, the online delivery of services one of the major objective of the government. And I'm sure as we go along, uh, we are very fast moving. I mean, the objective, of course, uh, ambition, of course, is zero footfall in government. In income tax department, it's already started happening that uh, today uh, income tax payers do not have to actually, I, I would say in most of the cases, you know, uh, do not have to really go to income tax office. You know. the, the corrections and resubmissions and payment of refunds and, you know, uh, all the issues to be resolved, they're all happening electronically in government. And I'm sure as we grow, uh, into this, uh, the, the, we would probably move towards zero footfall to government office. If it happens, obviously it was a, it will have a huge impact on the kind of difficulties people have been having uh, uh, in interacting with the government. This is my last slide. Just to spend a few minutes on this uh, about education delivery. I said that uh, education is another key area uh, where uh, uh, we have huge opportunities. Uh, Unfortunately, uh, I feel that uh, three major sectors, you know, where IT, where transformation is very important, and IT has not been able to, you know, penetrate uh, as much as it should, are the agriculture, health, and education. It's it's actually very strange that uh, you know uh, that while we are pre preparing these innovators through an education system. Uh, education system itself is to see, you know, huge transformation in how we deliver education. Uh, Professor Moni, particularly, of course, uh, I would uh, uh, definitely like to mention that for last almost three decades has been working in uh, inducting technology into agriculture sector, and some of his key initiatives uh, are actually now uh, being uh, accepted uh, by various segments of government and various segments of society. And I'm sure agriculture sector because he. Is, I'm, I'm told he's working on how to uh, encourage entrepreneurship in uh, agriculture sector from technology perspective. So agriculture is, uh, has begun to happen. Health sector off late, you know, has got uh, attention. Uh, devices, I mean, globally, people like Samsung and Apple by launching devices like watches, uh, you know, which not only measure pulse rate and BP, they can even pick up your ECG and things like that and connect you to your hospital and to your doctor. So things have started happening in this sector, but but uh, they have happened pretty late. And because they have not happened, again, I come back to our main theme, that they offer a huge opportunity to all of us in this country to innovate. In education sector, I feel that a whole lot of things have to happen. Thanks to COVID, I mean, it's, it doesn't sound very nice to say that, that thanks to COVID, that the education sector has uh, graduated, not just at university level, but even at a school level. Today, nursery kids are being taught online. You know, just imagine, uh, you know, we won't have imagined that nursery kids will be given uh, online classes, uh, you know, today. Uh, prior to March uh, this year, nobody would have thought of it. But in the last six months, that has started happening. So we have reached there, but I would say that just the beginning. Because uh, what we need to do primarily is to, what is this education all about ultimately? Ultimately, we are educating a generation so that that generation can serve the society. 
and one of the you know the highest priority requirement to do that is that we must our curriculum for education must change with time now i'm actually talking of meta processes not for i'm not saying that how a curriculum of computer science btech or mechanical btech should change i mean that's a matter of detail but at the next level as a level of meta process there is a need to think innovatively as to how i could make uh, my curriculum you know aligned to the needs of this and uh, that of course has followouts on how the course and reference material has to be prepared for example in reference material you know uh, one of the things in i mean even today i would say one of the things when we give assignment to students and even to engineering students you know forget uh, you know uh, you know under undergraduate and all that uh, one of the our expectation is that a student will go to internet find the material and prepare the assignment most of us know uh, and we still don't uh, do in this country we have, we have probably now begun off late we have begun to do that that in uh, places like united states if you if a student will do an assignment by taking material from internet that assignment will not be accepted the the emphasis and there have been tools around which will figure out that this this actually is copied from this place or from from the net you know now the point is that if we have to in, uh, encourage innovation the innovation as i said earlier cannot come by copying cannot come by catching up it has to come by original thinking and one of the real challenge of our education system and we have been saying this for two, for quite some time that this is a real challenge but now i am saying this in the context of the digital technologies digital technologies provide us huge opportunity to you know completely transform the way that we have been dealing with our education delivery system uh, we have been talking of industry just i'll take a couple of minutes to talk about this and i'll close with that we have been talking of industry academic uh, collaboration for a very very long time you know uh, i remember uh, in nic in uh, late 80s we used to take as many as 40 students 40 btech final year students from bits pilani into nic now it was not that we were actually obliging bits pilani you know as uh, one would as the industry generally feels you know i am taking nic as part of it industry in that context i am saying nic being a part of government is incidental but in the context of being an it organization uh, part of being part of it so 40 students being taken from bits pilani was actually other way around actually nic was being obliged by bits pilani because as it happens in any government uh, setup getting people recruited or uh, getting post catered has been a huge problem that's one secondly when you get a student that student is much more enthusiastic to learn you know and that is the point that you can leverage from students now when we started taking so many students then we started giving feedback to bits pilani that look when your students come to us we have to spend first few weeks teaching them these things why not you teach them in bits itself you know and bits planning started doing that and the students who used to come to nic were almost ready to you know uh, to work on the project the point i am trying to make is that industry academic collaboration cannot succeed unless industry starts realizing that they are the equal beneficiary of this collaboration and the way in this the way technology cycle is changing uh, at the pace industries we all know in this country and not just in this country globally industries are not able to keep pace with the technology developments now the best place for industry to upgrade themselves is the academics because the faculty and the students are much more enthusiastic to learn new things they have no legacy to carry as industry we have legacy to carry in students have no legacy to carry so they could be much more innovative and that is what industry should realize and that is where i feel that this point uh, has to be carried through to industry that it is a win win solution uh, to both for industry academic collaboration why i am saying in the context of transforming education delivery because that collaboration is going to be a major you know component of transforming the way we are delivering because if if educationists interact more with industry they become closer to what industry needs and obviously industry will produce what people need so that is where educa as educationists we become closer to the society 
so that uh, brings me to the close of this i just want to close it by saying that uh, digital india is not just about being digital is about uh, leapfrogging india social economic development we are all participants to that and we all hope that we will be able to contribute in wherever we are in this process thank you thank you to dr vk sharma the former director general of national informatics center for uh, delivering very innovative and progressive and impacting address on digital india transforming governance and society you talked about 70 minutes using five slides and the last three slides are giving a way forward for you know the academic institutions and industries and the entrepreneurs as to how they should walk in a different path which normally people will be using in a used path no you said very nicely that there is a need for a curriculum for education there's a change for a curriculum for education and it should be aligned with the needs this is where the innovation uh, will come out and uh, i you know and uh, then also you said that there is an education delivery in digital india you also during that lecture you mentioned my name and my contribution that that only you know the 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 knowledge which the practice which i gained during my 35 years of experience in national informatics center you know gave me a strength to you know bring out an education delivery in rural india through a change in curriculum synergization of technology in it and agriculture today i am very happy that as if i am report you are my senior so i am reporting to my senior after 7 years of gap that i was able to establish four centers of excellence in the direction in which you have talked about it for the last 70 minutes to motivate the rural students rural youth in you know you know uh, you know utilizing technology in for all round development center for agricultural informatics and e governance research studies center for agri business and disaster management studies center for informatics development solutions and applications center for industry 4.0 technology studies and application these four centers of excellence which are not there in any of the universities in the country in the world together for rural india this are all was is possible and feasible by the active support of a you know a private you know deemed to be university so we can sort of engineering technology and uh, and uh, this is from my experience i thought that if rural india has to be on the top of technology maps rural students they need not come to urban area let the technology move down to the rural area for the society needs and i am very happy about it you mentioned very appropriately in the three last three slides you know very effectively said it that curriculum change is a need of the hour which should meet the you know should be aligned with the needs dr vk sharma the former director general national informatics center and he has also carried a lot of other you know gaps you know cap you know you know during the last seven years you know in various you know disciplines as an advisor and consultant but today it is you know you know he was able to you know deliver a very galvanizing lecture address to the you know the students you know people from academic institutions and so you know people from industry that how digital india should transform governance and society and by by taking the lesson from how we to transform the governance and society it to summarize we are very happy dr vk sharma for your very impacting address today to the audience both in india and abroad you have very conclusively covered 
a historical perspective from 1970s to 2020 by starting from you know that you know 8 bit operating system how it moved to 16 bit operating system how ibm pc does took the cpm and then how it moved to personal computer i say personal computing and then you know that uh, graphic user interface applications and so on and so forth and you also said it that how it revolutionized the social media technologies like facebook in 2004 and youtube youtube in 2005 and twitter 2006 and also how linkedin is networking all the people together you know, I don't. I, I, I don't. I, we are always. You will always able to. You know, say that how these people are able to find out some catching acronyms. You know that you know. We once upon a time we used to always put the first letter from everything and you create an acronym which na, never gave any meaning. You know, on those days we used to appreciate UNESCO, even though it is a first letter from various words, but it has become a very you know you know uh, you know uh, pronounceable word in a scope with all vowels and so on and so forth so even identifying such type of acronym itself is a big task to mesmerize the people to use the technology facebook twitter you know and you know youtube and linkedin you know it's around some of the things which our youngsters will bring in you know that you know you know now you know 220 about 225 uh, apps, uh, Chinese apps have been ban banned, but let our uh, youths work, you know, studying and working in, you know, various higher educational institutions in industry come out with the befitting, you know, such apps for India with the, you know, names which it will be in the mind of everybody. So thanks for bringing out all this macro level view of future, you know, vision to the country. And you also talked about very nicely that the need for IT ecosystems, because you know that you know you know and uh, social media today, all pervasive digital India, governance in digital India, and education delivery in digital India, you know very effectively you brought it out. Then you also talked about that the how the telecom sector has now has become like you know that uh, you know adopting service oriented architecture you know that you know you don't have to create verticals but you also given a very caution that even though we have achieved e government and e governance but there is no interoperability of the information systems you now within the government applications this is more important so if the decision making capability has to come up in a very you know effective manner for problem solving you know that interoperability of information system databases are more important because for example one application for you know that uh, insecticide license the industry has to file about more than 10 applications and 10 applications you know half of the applications will be common in nature and uh, you know you know it can try you know from one government database it can go to other the government database the same one example when I was the advisor IT in Delhi Development Authority as a post for you know uh, in a retirement one for I was there for about three and a half years. That even a public grievances retrieval system, one from Prime Minister's office, one from Lieutenant Governor office, one from Chief Minister's office, one from you know the uh, Delhi Development Authority, Delhi Development Authorities for the entire Delhi. Because for every any grievances, people don't go to every all the four applications cannot interact one another, each other. So this is where the so e-governance, you know, the interoperability of system is more important. Interfacing with all social media is more important. If the public grievances are taken care of, the e-governance will be, you know, successful. You know, it's an important thing that and uh, and you very rightly said it that interoperability of information system is more you know is needed to be done and also very with example he came up with that behind the scene how artificial intelligence is technology is being used it you are nowadays many times i used to see that using mobile phone smart mobile phone it captured all our informations 
and you become a, a you know a, you know man with the new clothes you know emperor with the new cloth you do not know how behind the scene it is being working you know being captured information and so on and so forth is a technology innovation and which makes us that how to you know bring out such a technology innovation from the you know the latent heat of energy which is available with every youth in the country and uh, your five slides gave us a complete way forward for digitalizing the indian economy indian as a society and how to bring out society 5.0 and the uh, dr vikas sharma thank you very much for your you know very you know impactful lecture today addressed to the audience of this international webinar series and i thank you very much and uh, you know we will continue to you know get engaged you know for three, three and a half decades we were together and now after you know 2014 you know that we will also would like to continue to work together to bring in whatever you know you know service which we can do through technology understanding you know it, it will be very nice thank you very much good day thank you thank you professor moni it has been a pleasure to be part of your platform uh, you are doing great service through this platform and i would be happy to contribute in whatever way you think appropriate in future thank you thank you very much thank you